All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Hates. I'm with uh, Dark Horse Analytics. Welcome to Lunchalytics 55, June 2020. Uh, this is our third COVID Lunchalytics. And the benefits of COVID is we get to uh, reach out to an audience much wider than we would normally and also to speakers much wider than we would normally. So uh, we're very fortunate today to have David Williams uh, from Opportunity Insights. He's the Director of Policy Outreach. Um, for those who don't know what Opportunity Insights is, just Google it and click around. It's a pretty amazing uh, research group based out of Harvard uh, and Brown University in the US. And uh, they do some amazing work uh, connecting the roots of poverty uh, to place and location and, and coming up with very targeted uh, ways to deal with, uh, you know, historical poverty in the U.S. and other things. And, and David will be talking about that. And we also have Richard Coffin, who is the Director of Product at USA Facts. And their goal is to bring unbiased data to the political and civic discussions in the U.S., and uh, we're, we're very thankful to have both of those. Before I hand it over to David, who's going to kick things off. Um, welcome everyone, glad you could be here. I wanna mention our sponsors. We have Dark Horse Analytics uh, as the perennial sponsor. Uh, we have Alberta Treasury Branch. We have the Alberta Blue Cross. We have Startup Edmonton and we have the Nate Computer Training Center as our sponsors. This is the last Lunchalytics for the season and we will be reconvening back in September, October timeframe. Um, so we are looking for new sponsors. If you would uh, love to have your name uh, up here and then memorialized on the internet forever, um, please contact myself or Craig or Olivia and let us know. And the sponsorships can either be for a specific session or for the entire season. We course prefer the entire season but uh, you get all kinds of amazing benefits um, not the least of which is having your logo talked about in front of a, a very engaged audience without further ado I'm going to hand it over to David uh, from Opportunity Insights and uh, take it away David thank you very much Daniel really appreciate um, the opportunity to be here and help close out the um, season in what looks like it'll be a very American centric um, series of, of presentations, so very happy to share that perspective um, with you all. Uh, and so just kind of as background, and again, I serve as the Director of Policy Outreach um, at Opportunity Insights, um, and we're a research and policy institute um, based at Harvard University that was founded by economics professors Raj Chetty, Nathan Hendren, and John Friedman. Um, and it's our mission it's our mission to use big data to study um, upward mobility and economic opportunity. Um, and we work to identify scalable solutions that will empower families to rise out of poverty and achieve better life outcomes. Um, and today I'll be talking about making big data matter. Um, specifically, I'll touch on um, two initiatives that we actually piloted with Dark Horse, um, the Opportunity Atlas and the Economic Tracker. Um, but you know, really want to talk about how we can use big data to tell better stories, um, to uplift and empower the voices that we need to hear from the most, and then also really how do we influence public policy and really support our communities. Um, and to talk a little bit about how we do that, I'm going to start with the concept of the American dream. Um, it's something that is complicated and means many different things to many different people, but at its core, it's the idea that if you work hard, that you will have the opportunity to be successful. If you provide for your family, that your children will have more opportunity than you. But how do we understand if we're living up to that reality? Um, so something our research team did was trying to distill that concept into a relatively simple statistic. So using historical IRS records, we can compare individuals' earnings to that of their parents. And something we see is that Historically, that idea of the American dream was real, right? So individuals who were born in the 1940s had a 90% chance of growing up to earn more than their parents, to have a higher standard 
of living. But something we see is that that has changed dramatically. So much so that by, get, by the time you get to the 1980s, for folks who are entering in the job market today who are in their 30s, that dream has turned into a coin flip. Right? There's now a 50-50 chance whether or not you will grow up to earn more than your parents. In many ways, we think that's at the root of much of the cultural, social, and political frustration that we see today. Um, a frustration that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis and something that we see really coming to the fore um, with, the, with the protests following the killing of George Floyd um, at the hands of the police in Minneapolis. Um, I think it's something that you know, isn't a surprise to many of us. Um, and my hometown is in Detroit. And it reminds me of two names, um, Malice Green and Ayanna Jones. Uh, Malice Green in 1992 was killed by blunt force trauma after he was beat by the D Detroit police. Ayanna Jones was only seven years old when she was killed during a police raid in Detroit in 2010. And every city in the U.S. has these names and has these stories. And I think something we're seeing today is that these frustrations have been simmering specifically in the Black community, and now they tend to be boiling over. But the question is, now that we see the protest, now that we see the anger, right, we've seen that before. We saw that in Detroit. We saw that in L.A. We see that across the country. But can we channel that anger into tangible change? And it reminds me of the work that I did before Opportunity Insights. I serve in the mayor's office in Detroit, my hometown, um, our economic development team. And Detroit, as you may know, just a few years ago when I was entering into the administration, was entering into the largest municipal bankruptcy in US history. It's a city that over the past 20 years lost over a quarter million people. Yeah, one in three homes over the past 15 years was lost to tax foreclosure. So we were tasked with trying to literally rebuild the physical infrastructure of the city in a sustainable way. It's gonna revitalize a once great city. And by working with the city along with the county, the philanthropic community, private community, nonprofits, we started to see real progress. Getting rid of blight, starting to see homes being rehabilitated, jobs coming into the city, investments moving into our neighborhoods. We saw that physical change taking place. But something that was in the back of my mind and the mind of my colleagues was as we're seeing this new growth and development, are we truly changing the life outcomes of the most vulnerable for children like Ayanna Jones? Are we creating better life outcomes for them as we move forward? And I feel lucky to now work for an organization that's, that has the capacity and the dedication to try and ask and answer those difficult questions. And so some of our more recent research using Census Bureau data and IRS records, we're able to track the outcomes of 20 million children across the United States. We can focus specifically on kids who grew up in low-income families. We know where they grew up based on their parents' records, and we can follow their outcomes into adulthood. So also looking at their earnings, incarceration rates, teen pregnancy rates as they move into adulthood. And then we can look at those outcomes for every census tract and neighborhood in the country. And something we see is that opportunity varies dramatically across the country. You have these areas of deep blue in the, in the central Midwest and on the coast that have extremely high rates of, mo of mobility, higher than any other country that we have data for. But you have these areas in deep red, especially the southeast of the United States and areas in the Rust Belt like Detroit and Cleveland where if you grow up in a low-income family, on average, you tend to stay a low-income adult, very low rates of upward mobility. And I think showing it in these colors and on this map shows those disparate outcomes and that opportunity differs so dramatically across the country. And something we see that's probably not surprising intuitively, especially for many in the US, but that race is one of those factors that really drives opportunity. So this map looks at economic mobility rates in the same way, looks at low-income children and how much they earn on average in adulthood. But now we're looking specifically at outcomes for black men compared to white men. And something to note is that both these maps are on the same color scale. And what that means is that the best places in terms of outcomes for black men 
are still worse than the worst places for white men. So young boys growing up in the same community, in the same neighborhood, on the same block, in similar types of families, are having very different outcomes based on race. And something we see in the data as well is that race is such an influencing factor that it also influences young men who grow up in high income families. So this graphic that was created using our data by the New York Times looks at boys growing up in high income families. And you see those green dots towards the top are white men who tend to stay in the upper income spectrum. But then you see these pink dots that cascade. And those represent black men who are actually more likely to grow up to be lower income adults than to just stay in that same income bracket. Right? And each of these dots represents a real person. Right? It represents hopes and dreams and ambitions that for too many, especially for young black men, are not coming true. And so we work on thinking about how do we take this data, how do we raise awareness, but how do we also create change through policy? And so right, we have this data, and how do we use it to have an impact? So besides just putting out research papers, as I mentioned, we partnered with Dark Horse Analytics and the Census Bureau to create the Opportunity Atlas, available at opportunityatlas.org. That takes all this data and makes it available for policymakers, practitioners, and the general public to be able to look at outcomes in their own neighborhoods, to better understand what's happening in their own backyards. I think what's powerful about this is that the data only takes us so far. When we're able to actually bring science to the table, but then use personal narrative and on the ground experience, we have the opportunity to really understand what's happening. When people find out where Audra Palacio is from, they often react in disbelief. Well, how, how could you come from there and you live there? And it's like, almost as if it's like, I can't believe you made it out. Nearly 40% of Brownsville lives in poverty. And if you look at the Opportunity Atlas and zoom into Brownsville, a lot of it is exactly what you'd expect. Black kids raised in the area 30 some years ago now make about $17,000 a year, same as their parents. But once you head across Dumont Avenue, everything changes. Black kids from the same exact background are doing better than their parents, making around $26,000 a year. In the 80s, New York City had been hard hit by a recession. Then the crack and HIV epidemics. There was a part of Brownsville that was totally abandoned, the other side of Dumont. The New York City government sold over 16 square blocks of Brownsville to the East Brooklyn congregations for one dollar. Those blocks were dilapidated, run down. The city agreed to build infrastructure and provide cash subsidies for over a thousand affordable homes. They would start selling at $30,000 each. They were called Nehemiah houses, after the man in the Bible who rebuilt parts of Jerusalem. The family was growing, and we needed something that was much better for the children. I didn't like the elevators, up and down the elevators for my children, because it was a lot of people living in the housing projects. Audra Palacio was six when they bought the house. I remember when we moved into the Nehemiahs. We were so excited. We had rooms, we had space, we had our backyard. Here's Reverend Brawley. He says the Nehemiah houses in Brooklyn gave children a space to do homework, a good night's sleep. When people have ownership of their properties, ownership of their community, you have a better chance of addressing all core issues, such as education and quality of life. After I leave the family, I walk just a few blocks to Dumont Avenue. According to the Atlas, it's the dividing line. On the map, it looks jarring, but in person, it's completely unspectacular. People bustle on their way to work, cars zoom by. Just another New York City street. It means nothing, but what side you're on means everything. Jasmine Garst, NPR News, New York. So millions of stories exist like this across the country. And so, you know, part of my role opportunity is to think through how do we leverage these stories, this narrative to impact policy and impact change. 
And like the conversation in Brownsville, one thing we can do is think about housing policy in particular. Because we're able to pinpoint those neighborhoods that have better outcomes for low-income kids, it helps us think more critical about our housing policy. Um, for example, the Section 8 program or the Housing Choice Voucher Program, a rental subsidy that, um, that supports low-income families to pay their, their rent, the U.S. Invest, invest billions of dollars in this program every single year and millions of families benefit from it. But something we see across the country, something we can see on this map in Seattle, is that the vast majority of families who have access to this resource use it in high poverty neighborhoods that have worse outcomes for low income children. We see it in Seattle, we see it in my hometown of Detroit, we see it across the country. So why aren't we better able to leverage this resource as a springboard to economic mobility? One thing we see in Seattle is that only about 10% of the families who use housing choice vouchers end up living in higher opportunity areas, areas where we see historically when low income kids grow up there, they have better outcomes. So we use that data, our understanding of the impact of neighborhoods, and we worked with the housing authorities in Seattle and King County based on their experience to understand what are the barriers that families face when they're searching for new apartments. And if we reduce these barriers, would they be more likely to move to a wider range of places throughout the region? So we piloted something called Creating Moves to Opportunity. It was a randomized trial where one group of applicants received the normal services through the housing authority, but another received additional supports. So customized search assistance where they had the support of a housing counselor to coach them and walk them through the housing search process. We engaged with landlords to bring down some of the red tape around the program, but to also bring down the stigma that some landlords had about families using these vouchers. We also provided short-term financial assistance to these families to help with moving expenses, rental applications, and security deposits. So what we saw is that for the families who did not receive the extra support, about 13 to 14 percent of those families ended up moving to higher opportunity places, pretty similar to that historical rate. Those families who did receive those services were almost four times more likely to move to higher opportunity places. In these neighborhoods that we see when children move there, they on average earn upwards of $150,000 more over the course of their lifetime. So real tangible impact to help families and children move out of poverty. And we saw that these families had a much wider range of neighborhoods where they ended up moving. And I think at its core, it was about empowering families, not telling them where to move or making um, subjective judgments about places, but empowering families to make the best choice on behalf of themselves and their children. And something we saw is that the families who received these services, who made these higher opportunity moves, they were much more satisfied with their neighborhood and really wanted to stay in these places. So being able to combine the data with that practitioner perspective and also having qualitative research to better understand how this program impacted these families. And when you talk with the families, that individualized support was a huge relief. Right? Families were tired of living around chaos and needed this housing assistance. And families really felt that their children we're now receiving more opportunity. This is my little casa. Okay, you come in. Having our own place feels really good. There's quite a few daycare centers around here. I know there's a good elementary school just up the street. I mean, I love this area. What we're finding from this experiment is truly amazing. Some of the biggest impacts I've ever seen as a social scientist. Had Nikki stayed in the neighborhood where she lived before, our data showed that Theo's prospects would be dramatically lower than what they are now. So with this program, again, combining the data with practitioner perspective and using the narratives of families who are impacted, there's a potential to one, start to roll back our history of housing discrimination and redlining and segregation. But also there are concrete policy pathways forward to lead towards more transformative change. So even before we piloted the CMTO program, the Housing Choice Voucher Mobility Demonstration Act was passed that provided 50 million additional dollars to run more pilots like CMTO. 
and later that, that year, a new bill was introduced that would introduce potentially half a million more vouchers across the country, which would be billions of dollars in, in an investment to secure housing for many more families, but also encourage these moves to opportunity, trying to create pathways to economic mobility. So seeing how we can create systemic change through policymaking and through big data with a tool like the Opportunity Atlas and understanding the deep roots of economic opportunity and inequality, I think we were all then faced with a very different type of problem. The COVID-19 crisis introduced something that was unprecedented both in size and scale. And I think this graphic from the New York Times helped show how unprecedented it was looking at numbers of job losses in the U.S. that we'd never seen before. And I think really demonstrates how visualizing that can be extremely powerful. But unlike the Opportunity Atlas, where we were looking at kind of the deep long-term roots of many of these problems, the pandemic highlighted the need for rapid data for understanding how our economy is changing day by day so that we can better respond. And something we saw is that resources like the John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center have become indispensable to public health practitioners, right? Being able to see cases and deaths and testing every single day gives us the ability to respond more effectively. But something we saw is that a similar resource was not available on the economic side. Right? There are billions of transactions every day that give a very precise picture of how our economy is impacting our communities, but most of that data is held by private companies and not available to the public. So we partnered with several companies, job postings firms, um, payroll processing firms, fintech firms who have this data. We brought it together, standardized it, and put it in a platform called the Economic Traffic. It allows us to track the impacts of COVID-19 on people, businesses, and communities across the United States, but most importantly, doing so in real time. That graphic that the New York Times showed was looking at the job report, which comes out every month. Other publicly available sources come out every quarter. And this crisis is changing and evolving so rapidly that that data is already out of date by the time it hits the newsstands. So our goal was to make a tool that would allow policymakers to understand what's happening in real time and be able to react in real time as well. And we actually launched um, this tool today and it's already helping us understand the nuance of what's happening. And in the US in particularly, right, it's the wealthy who've cut most of their spending and the low income folks who work in those impacted industries who are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. But like the Atlas, there are millions of stories and communities are being impacted in different ways. So we wanted to make this data available for local policymakers and practitioners and to help people understand how the crisis is impacting their own community. So we look at consumer spending. And we look at it for every state and county in the country. And something we've heard is that this can help state leaders and county leaders more precisely calculate their budgets and create fiscal forecasts so they can plan more effectively for the future as they're trying to re respond. We can also see as states close and begin to open back up, are small businesses opening and closing? Something we saw is that in the US, even before states officially closed, small businesses were closing in response to the dangers posed by COVID. And even now that states are opening back up, it'll be very important to see rapidly if small businesses are coming back or if they're still staying shuttered because our COVID case rate isn't going down. And then along with those economic indicators, we can also better understand the social impact of the crisis. So something we can look at is educational engagement. And we use an educational platform that has an online component, but it's used in tandem with in-classroom teaching. So we can look across the country and see if students are continuing to stay engaged with this platform while their schools close. And something we see across the country, we see variation across the country, but we see generally high income communities have much higher levels of engagement, whereas low income communities are really struggling to keep their students engaged and participating. And this can be a tool to help raise awareness about the structural inequalities that we've already seen from the Atlas, 
but also help us try and pinpoint where we need to provide more resources to support the most vulnerable. So we're hoping that this can be a tool that can help policymakers respond to the crisis and foment a recovery. But I think something that we've seen in part by the death of George Floyd and the mass protests is that if recovery means returning to the status quo, that's not good enough. I think our data shows that the status quo is untenable. We also need to focus on the roots of inequality to make sure that we honor the legacies of George Floyd, of Ayanna Jones, of Malice Green, and countless other victims of police brutality, victims of housing segregation, victims of, of racial inequity. We can use our data to hold ourselves and our leaders accountable. But let's use those stories to rededicate ourselves to making sure that the American dream becomes a reality for everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, pleased to be here. I appreciate the platform. I'm happy to have a dialogue and I think I need to go through the questions now. We can start kind of talking about um, in more detail some of these tools. Um, so there's a couple questions I think asking about kind of how we compare children's earnings to that of their, of their parents. Basically what we do, we adjust for in inflation, but we compare earnings at around the same age, um, so kind of in their mid-30s, when we adjust for inflation, we see if the household incomes of the children are above or below the household incomes of their parents. Um, and so again, we noted that for folks who were born in the 1940s, um, over 90% of folks had household incomes higher than their parents, and that's at about 50% now for folks who are in their mid-30s um, today. I think it's something that interestingly, um, you know, part of that is due to just lower growth rates in general in the US, um, but a large proportion of that, we see directly trends with inequality. And I think again, we see somewhat similar trends in other countries, but it's much more dramatic in the US um, than other countries in Europe and in Canada. And I think um, another question is central to what we do. So, so they're asking about um, you know, moving to opportunity is one possible solution, but how do we bring opportunity to communities and to individuals? Um, so you know, part of what we do as well is we can look at particular programs. I mean, we can, if there was a randomized trial, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, we can then track those children if we're able to link them with our data to better understand the impacts in the long term of, of those programs. Um, we're also very interested in place-based revitalization efforts. I mean, that's what I was deeply involved in, in Detroit, like real deep neighborhood revitalization efforts. There are models in the US, places like the Harlem Children's Zone, um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston, which show great promise. But there's a lot of work to be done to better understand how you can take successful programs like that and scale them in a sustainable way. I think that, that work takes a lot of time and effort. Um, and it's gonna take, I think, more investment and resources than we've currently dedicated um, to them currently. But I think, I think part of the idea of moving, it's, it's not that right, there are bad places and good places, but it really is about how do we empower families. So certain families, right, they might have a really strong social network. Maybe they speak a particular language or part of an immigrant community. They have a network of churches. Um, it might not be the best place in terms of what our data says, but that's the right place for them. Whereas other families, if they have the information, you know, moving out to a particular suburb might be better for them and their children. So I think step one is, it's really an issue of social justice, right? I think in the US especially, there's a very deep history of racial discrimination in the housing market with redlining. Um, and so kind of getting back to square one, like making sure that you know, everyone in America has the choice of where they want, want, to, want to live. And then critically thinking around, you know, as we can integrate our communities, as we can deconcentrate poverty, I think that actually makes the work of investing in place much more sustainable. Um, but that's a huge topic of research and exploration for us is not just moving folks around, not just housing mobility, but how do we invest in place more effectively? What are the best kinds of programs? How do we leverage our higher education system um, to support kids and, and families? It has the data and associated tools influence the supply of housing given growing demand. Um, 
And I think these are certain, so it's interesting. Um, I think Seattle was an interesting case because it's a very tight housing market. Um, so it's a place where um, it's one, expensive, um, and two, you would think it'd be especially hard in a place like Seattle for lower income families to move and find housing in these higher opportunity places. Um, but I think part of what we saw is that those units are out there. Um, and with the thoughtful policies that the housing authorities have, they're actually affordable within the guidelines of the program. But much of the barriers that we're seeing seem to be informational. And it looks as though when these families have that individualized support that can help coach them through and walk them through that, that housing search process, um, right, we saw with the numbers, there do seem to be great success um, with, with those families. I think it is a question though of if we're able to, and this will be a good problem to, to have, if we can scale programs like this up, we have to think about, right, what are those spillover effects? Um, I think I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we can get to a level of, of, of scale that necessitates worrying about some of those issues. Um, and then there's a question about if policymakers are actually using that tool. So that's a lot of my job. <laughs> um, so the research team does amazing work that's way above my head and, and pay grade. Um, but it's my job to use that research to translate it for a broad audience and then work with practitioners and policymakers to understand how it could be applied in their context. Um, and so one thing we're working on right now is actually um, working with additional communities to scale the CMTO program specifically. Um, so you know, working directly with housing authorities um, and seeing if this model can work in their community as well, along with having conversations with folks in Washington, D.C. about federal policy to make programs and resources like this more accessible um, at a broad scale. Um, and with the economic tracker, that's something that we want to get in the hands of policymakers directly. Um, so we hold webinars and we hold different events. We're creating policy use cases, working with organizations in the U.S. like the National Governors Association, National County Association, National League of Cities to one, make sure they're aware of the tools and the research, but also to get their feedback. Um, the economic tracker in particular is something that we don't want to be a static tool. We want to add new data, add new functionalities to make sure that it is as responsive as possible to the needs of policymakers. So we're hitting the ground every day to make sure people are aware of the research, but also trying to be thought partners um, and kind of real life partners um, doing that work with them to leverage this data to have real, Im real impact. Um, I think as of right now, I don't think we have plans to scale to other countries. Um, the US has a lot of stuff to work on. So I think we're gonna be busy for a little bit. Um, but I know actually um, Professor Chetty um, you know, has been in conversation with folks in other countries. I think in India, Sweden, I think there are folks doing similar research in Canada as well, maybe at the University of Toronto. So I think we're not planning on scaling, but we're always interested in having conversations with folks who want to leverage um, data like this in similar ways. Um, so I think in the, in the US, we have pretty unique challenges, but I think you know, we see similar issues of, across the country. Oh, and there's a question about um, in the CMTO randomized trial, um, looking at the cost of the treatment compared to the cost of the voucher program itself. That's a really great question um, because, right, again, the U.S., we spend billions of dollars every year on affordable housing in general, and vouchers are, are expensive. So basically, families generally only have to pay one-third of their income every month on housing. And how, however much the rent is more than that, the voucher covers that. So oftentimes these vouchers are paying kind of tens of thousands of dollars every year for this housing access. And so part of our thought is if you can make a relatively small investment of a few thousand dollars, that's what this program costs per participant um, to help move these families to higher opportunity places, right? that in a certain sense pays for itself in the long-term outcomes of those children. Um, so in the voucher context specifically, we think that initial in investment is really worth it, given that it's kind of a marginal, it's a pretty small and marginal cost compared to what the voucher costs um, itself. And there's a question about um, what are the roots of inequality? So, you know, there's no specific formula that we have on what makes a neighborhood higher opportunity, but there are some factors that we see in the data. So probably not surprisingly, places that have 
lower poverty rates and higher median income. You see better outcome for low-income kids who grow up there. Um, places that have better schools, specifically for low-income kids, have better outcomes. Um, but we also see right, things like social capital, um, places that have higher levels of neighborhood cohesion, right, where we actually see kind of people um, bonding and having relationships across lines of difference. Those seem to be places that have better outcomes as, as well. One thing that struck me in the data was that, especially for young black men, when they grow up, regardless of if they have a father figure in their own household, if they grow up in a community that has more black fathers present, all the young black men in that neighborhood have better outcomes. Um, similar to some other research we did looking at um, the rates of inventorship. You see that in communities that have more female inventors, um, the young women who grow up there are more likely to file patents and become inventors. Um, and to me, that speaks to the fact that right, you know, having people who live nearby that, that, that you can see and relate to, that model pathways through school into college and stable careers really seems to have an impact that we can actually see in this data. Um, so I think kind of deconcentrating poverty, you know, people seeing role models in their communities really seems to have an impact. Um, Another question about making sure policymakers, um, you know, actually access this data. So that's why, so that's what I get paid for, right? It's, it gets to be out in, in the field. I think one, both kind of making sure people are aware of the data, but again, really getting feedback from policymakers that can hopefully inform our research agenda um, as well. Um, and so there's one question about the causality um, piece of the research. And I think one example is the Opportunity Atlas, right? I think, you know, there might be the assumption that you see better outcomes in certain places because certain kinds of people move to those, those neighborhoods. Um, so something that the research team did was kind of taking that same cohort of 20 million kids we are able to track their outcomes. We looked at 7 million families who moved across communities in the U.S. And something we saw is that even within the same family, let's say a family moved from a low opportunity place to a higher opportunity place. Within that same family, that younger sibling who had more exposure to that higher outcome place, they on average had better outcomes than that older sibling who had less exposure. So I think that really speaks to not just that certain kinds of people move to certain kinds of places, but that the actual neighborhood is having a real impact, that the level of exposure a person has has a real causal impact on those places. And I think with the Craig Moose to Opportunity Study, right, that was a randomized trial. But you know, that's kind of the gold standard of social science research. So actually having that control group and that treatment group to better understand if there is a causal impact of that program or intervention. And then but I think a part of that question too is that, right, Seattle looks very differently than other communities. So not just assuming that everything from Seattle might transit to other places, that's why we're not focused on running other pilots in other communities to understand if this could be a scalable solution as, as well. It's interesting, the considering proposing economic zones where all activity can be tracked and data can be collected. I think that's something that I think we've been thinking around in, in, in the place-based space, right? Like, is there a way to kind of better under, understand um, you know, how we can understand these really complicated um, but really promising place-based initiatives. Um, I think something that I'd be really interested in ex ex exploring, but we haven't gotten they have gotten there yet. I think, you know, I think now that we've launched the economic tracker, um, I think we actually have some research looking at issues like gentrification and mixed use and mixed income housing. Um, so I think we'll be kind of trying to figure out new creative ways to look at some of these place-based strategies. Oh, and then the question of deconcentration of poverty. Um, so it's interesting, kind of what are the key factors that are affected by concentrated poverty? But that's a good question. I think, you know, again, uh, I don't want to overemphasize it, but I think there is something about when you have a more diverse income mix, right? Like seeing people that you can relate to who, who model those, those, those pathways, I think that is something that is oftentimes overlooked. So call it neighborhood cohesion, social capital. Um, Right, that seems to be a factor that um, is sometimes harder to put your, your finger on, but I think it's something that we think really does drive um, outcomes in general. Um, and this question about brain drain for lower opportunity neighborhoods. I think that's a really important question. I think it's interesting the parallel 
I think it's a bit different than a question around charter schools. Um, but I think, you know, similar concerns are really valid. But I think kind of my overall goal, you know, if you can scale programs like this up is really to deconcentrate poverty and to empower families who, you know, haven't had access to the housing market that, that they used to. I think especially those most vulnerable families. I think, you know, I did a lot of work on regional planning in my, in, in my previous career. And, right, and I think there's this idea that, right, especially in the US, that there are poor neighborhoods and rich places. Um, and can we actually envision a future where, yeah, there are low income folks, but they actually just live in normal neighborhoods across all of our states and all of our regions. Um, so that you know, we're not having to you know, invest in places because constant poverty, we're just investing in the folks who need so support in neighborhoods that are relatively stable. Um, so I think it both in involves supporting families that, that you know, may need to move where that's the best option for them, but also thinking about when middle class families and higher income families move to places that were once disinvested in, how can we leverage those resources but also ensure that the families who stayed in these places also benefit from that growth and development as well. I think gentrification has always been a big issue at the top of mind for folks like me who work in city government. So how do we actually bring in resources in a way that creates stable communities but also benefits those low-income families who've been in these places for a long time um, as well? Um, and then, you know, do you share the lessons? Again, I think that's at the core of what we do. So CMTO, we're trying to expand um, that program in more communities. And the economic tracker is something that we're working very hard to, one, again, just get the word out about this, this tool. We're creating policy use cases, kind of our, our thoughts on how we think this tool can impact policy, but we're having active conversations with policymakers to understand their needs and how we can, in subsequent versions of the tracker, make it even more responsive. Um, I think especially getting to deeper levels of granularity, so looking not just at the county level, but looking at zip codes and neighborhoods and seeing where the recovery is coming up in different ways, very, very lo locally, and also looking at subgroups. So looking at black families versus white families, low-income families versus high-income families, to really understand if we're moving towards an equitable recovery um, as we move forward. All right, so I think I will stop there for now. Um, but again, I'm super pleased to be here. I think this is my this is my first international speaking engagement at Opportunity Insights, even though I'm sitting inside my home in Harlem in New York. Um, so just really pleased to be here and looking forward to Richard's talk as well. And you know, happy to answer any follow-up questions um, via email, via via Twitter. We try and stay as engaged as possible. So I'm you know, happy to follow up and keep that dialogue going. Well, thank, thank you very much, David. Really appreciate the talk. Uh, I think it was just the tip of the iceberg of, of all that's going on. Uh, I, I, I want to mention to the group here that part of what really is interesting about the way Opportunity Insights is organized is they have a very strong research base and they have a, a, you know, a huge team of researchers that do this work and, and the rigorous big data uh, experimentation and, and insight development. Um, and, and so you get a lot of answers, but that answer is very local. And so then they, they've worked on data visualization as a way to communicate those answers more broadly. Uh, and, and there are different answers in Detroit than there are in Seattle. But they didn't stop there. They actually built a policy outreach team, uh, of which uh, David is a, a, the director. And their goal is to kind of handhold the policymakers through the process of uh, consuming those insights for their communities. And so it's kind of the whole value chain of the research to the communication to the implementation that I think is, is very unique in the, in the way they develop their research lab. So uh, kudos to you, David, and, and your team and, and what you're doing. Really appreciate it and, and your talk today.